reconvene a committee here, the subcommittee on oversight investigations and our hearing. I remind the witnesses they're under oath. When we left, I believe, uh, Mr. Burgess, it was your turn for questions on round two, if you would, please. And Mr. Moore will be here in a minute. We'll okay. Tracking them down. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. McKay, you made reference in answer to an earlier question that the uh, Obama administration and the White House and the Cabinet had been helpful during this event. Is, is that a fair statement? Do I remember you saying that correctly? Yes, I think I said the, the administration and the, his Cabinet, yes. Have you been to the White House since the accident occurred? Yes, I've not seen the President, but I've met with uh, Secretary Napolitano and Secretary Salazar and other administration officials, yes. Would, uh, Mr. Chairman, could I ask that the White House make available to us the uh, any minutes or notes or emails that would be relevant to that meeting? Well, as the gentleman knows, he can ask. I'm not guaranteeing what kind of response you're going to get, but uh, yes, you can ask. Well, I just think it would be helpful to us. Were were you the only executive of a of an oil company who was who was there, or were was this a collaborative response, uh, a response from many people who work in the industry to try to help solve a problem? This, this was uh, the meetings that I'm talking about were myself and Tony Hayward, BP, both of us BP. Okay. Are you aware of, of any other meetings that have occurred with uh, executives of other companies? On, I'm not aware on this particular issue. This issue. When, can, can I ask you when, when that meeting occurred? Um, there have been several to, over the last uh, over the three week period that we've been in. Okay. Um, when when would the first meeting have been? Uh, w within the first week of the accident, I, I believe. And that information, Mr. Chairman, should be available to us with White House logs if they will furnish us that information. Is that do I understand that correctly? Well, again, Mr. Burgess, as, as you know, because you've used the procedure before, I'd, I'd put the request in writing. We'll submit it to the White House and see what happens. Uh, I'm not sure what the extent of the uh, discussions and what is uh, appropriate, what is not. I, I know when we speak about energy or energy policy, there's been some uh, reluctance of the courts because uh, under the Cheney uh, Energy Committee. Well, that would, I don't get too, but too, the gentleman far, too far. Oh, no, because my time is limited. We will go on your time. Oh, we'll give you back an extra 30 seconds. Yeah, I know you will. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, it, would just, it would just be helpful to us. We will put that in writing. And uh, aside from the Secretary uh, Napolitano and Secretary Salazar, I assume Department of Interior was present, were, were there White House personnel present as well? Chief of Staff, Deputy Chief of Staff? No. No. Just, just people from the agency? Um, there were other, Carol, Carolyn Browner. Uh, well, certainly to the extent that these involved agency personnel, Department of Interior, Department of Homeland Security, we as the oversight body of this Congress should have the ability to get that information. That's not, in my understanding, that should not be covered under executive privilege. So I will make that request. In, uh, <clears throat> Will the gentleman yield if you're going to make a request because it's going to come through me and I'd like to have a clarification from you? If uh, the chairman will yield me an additional minute. I'll yield you an additional minute, you betcha. What does the gentleman wish to request? The log of these visitors and the fact that they were at the White House meeting with people within the administration? Yes, and I'd like to know what was discussed. Well, you, you, I don't know that you're entitled to that, but the White House already posts its logs as to who comes in and meets with the very, this is something we didn't have in the previous administration. Shuns, they, they do have a, a posting of the log, and you can easily find out who came in and from the outside and who met with people in the well, White Mr. House. I don't know why you would be entitled to have the discussions or notes or anything like that. I don't know what the predicate is Chairman, for asking that. It may have occurred to you we're having a great deal of difficulty getting to the actual causation. At these, this is the second hearing we had one. Closed hearing last week. Uh, this is an open hearing, but we're really having a lot of difficulty getting to causation. There's a lot of people talking past each other, and I just think if there was a frank discussion at the White House, that we might benefit from the information that was exchanged that day. Gentlemen, you all certainly take it under advisement. I thank the chairman for the consideration. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to pronounce your name correctly, Mr. Probert or Probert. 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 Yes. Um, Mr. Moore obviously deals with the, uh, the blow-up protector, but if, if, I think if I understand the situation correctly, the blow-up protector is not 
the primary control of the well, that would actually be the, the material in the, in the drill shaft itself, the mud, that would be the primary control. Is that correct? Yes, that would be correct. And you, in your testimony, talked about, and it intrigued me because it was the same thing I read in the New Orleans paper last Friday, that there was a removal of the drilling mud from the stack. The initial plug, the primer, or the or, or one cement plug had been placed. The drilling mud was removed and replaced with seawater. And before the second plug was placed, the accident occurred. Is that correct? The, uh, the process was, uh, first of all, to do a positive test, which was conducted uh, by, by the uh, Transocean. The second procedure was then to do a negative test, which is also conducted by Transocean, but requires removing some of the uh, drilling fluid, at least from the drill pipe. And, then, and subsequently, uh, after, the, uh, after a successful um, negative test, to the extent the test was successful, then they would go ahead and evacuate or replace the uh, drilling fluid in the riser uh, with seawater in advance of uh, setting the plug and then ultimately pulling off the well. And I will defer to Mr. Newman if, if I have any part of that process incorrect. But reported in the, in the Times-Picayune last Friday, there was concern that the drilling mud was removed at a point prior to where it normally would have been removed and replaced with seawater. But that, is that an error on the part of the paper reporting that? No, I think the, uh, the, 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 the question and point that was raised, and it was raised in testimony yesterday, was that when you uh, replace the drilling fluid in the riser with seawater, you reduce the density, effective density, significantly. Right. And had there not been a successful negative test, then that would clearly be a situation which would be problematic uh, for the well since you're reducing the hydrostatic pressure on the well. But the test wasn't successful. I, I have no knowledge of that. Does anybody have any knowledge of that? That's the negative test, 1,400 PSI applied to the drill stack and the uh, no pressure recorded in the chokes, the dead dead man's cut off or whatever it is. Is that a positive test or a negative? I, mean, was that, I got the impression that was not a good result. Is that correct? Uh, the actual results of the test, Congressman, were first reported to me by Chairman Waxman today in Chairman Waxman's statement. And to my knowledge, you know, to my knowledge prior to this hearing, I was not aware of the results. Uh, I think Chairman Waxman alluded to some confusion with respect to those test results. And that's what I know about the test results. But if I'm understanding Mr. Probert correctly, if the test was, was, was not the expected result, then it may be not be a good idea to pull off the drilling mud and reduce the hydrostatic pressure on the column over the, the drill shaft. Did, did I understand your, your statement correctly about that? Well, you said if the test was, was correct, then it wouldn't be a problem to reduce the hydrostatic pressure by removing the mud. But the test wasn't correct mud was still removed, is that a problem with what hap subsequently happened? And really, Mr. McKay, feel, feel free to, to, to enter into the discussion. I, I, th I, th I mean, what I believe is there, there were discrepancies, it appears, in that negative test where you had 1,400 PSI on the drill pipe and zero on the choke and kill lines. I think the investigation needs to look hard at how that information was either disseminated, used, and decisions made off of it. And what and who and what decisions and were made after that point? And what would be drilling best practice if you if you encountered an anomaly like like that test? To to go ahead and remove the mud, or to wait until we found out what the problem was and corrected the problem? I, I can't speculate on that individual situation. I I mean I really do think this is one of the key things the investigation is going to have to look at. Do you think it would ever be okay to remove question. the hydrostatic pressure on the column of mud if the test was not satisfactory? I'm sorry. Do you, would it ever be okay to remove that? that hydrostatic pressure of the mud column if that test wasn't satisfactory? Would there ever be a reason that that, oh, it's okay, go ahead and do that because we do it all the time? I, I haven't seen all the data. I can't, I just can't speculate on that. I just really can't. Well, you've seen a okay, lot more time, Mr. Burgess. I have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Waxman, for questions, please. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I want to go back to this issue as well. Uh, the question of the negative pressure test that we discussed earlier and the discrepancies in the negative pressure test that was performed on the well on the day of the blowout. And all of you seem to agree that uh, 
this would be a significant issue uh, and it would be a central question in the investigation. But I have a document, I think it's been given to you, Mr. McKay, it, it's a, an email. Uh, I, I thought it had been given to you in advance. And the, um, the email uh, talks about the testing procedures. Can you tell me whether these procedures were followed on the 20th? I cannot tell you whether they were followed. Okay, and that the, the um, last line of the document, and this is, a, by the way, this is an email, an internal email from BP, and it indicates uh, the, the, the things that would be done if there was a negative test that, uh, that uh, wasn't, uh, that showed a discrepancy. And the last line says that, uh, that um, we would send to Houston for confirmation. Plot on chart, send to Houston for confirmation. I assume this refers to BP's office in Houston? I would imagine so. Were the test results sent to Houston for confirmation before you resumed well operations on the 20th of April? It's it, it looks like to me, and I have to examine this, looks like to me this is after the, the, the last plug would have been set. I'd, we'd have to review this. I, but I don't, know if the, I don't know if it was sent to Houston or not. That last plug didn't get sent. So. Well, this, is, th this email sets out the procedure, as I understand it, for BP when you have a problem with that negative test. And they indicate the things that should be done. And the last one is you'd send it to uh, Houston. Do you know whether the results were sent to Houston before the well was back in operation? I, I don't believe so. I believe the explosion occurred before number six happened. So you don't, is it fair to say you don't believe that the officials in Houston approved the resumption of the operations of the well? I don't know. Okay. Was MMS involved in these decisions, to your knowledge? I don't know. There have been reports that shortly before the blowout, the uh, BP began displacing drilling mud with seawater. Do you know if that's accurate? That's what I've been told, but I, I'm, I haven't reviewed it. Did BP's office in Houston approve this procedure? Did they sign off on the decision to displace mud with seawater after the negative pressure test dis dis uh, discrepancy? I don't know. Okay. Do you know whether MMS signed off on this procedure? I'm not familiar with the procedure, nor am I familiar with who may have or may not have signed off on it. You're not familiar with the procedure itself within BP on how to deal with a negative test? Uh, not, not on this particular well, no. You have a technical expert with you. Could, we, uh, could you ask your technical expert for information on in yes. this regard? Could you, could you repeat the question, please? Well, I wanted to know uh, if, if, the, if this document sets out the pro procedure within BP when there's a, a negative test that indicates there's a problem. BP office in Houston. And I also want to know if the BP office in Houston approved this procedure and whether they signed off on the decision to displace mud with seawater after the negative pressure test discrepancy. Has he testified? Is he Maybe. So that. What my expert has told me is that this procedure looks like would have been used with the MMS procedure, the sundry procedure. Um, he doesn't know, nor do I know, whether this was communicated to, you know, confirmed to Houston. I, what I would say reading this, it looks like it's a procedure to get through the setting of the last plug after a successful negative test. After a successful negative test. Well, that's the way it looks to me. I see. So after a successful negative test, you would contact Houston to have them sign off on the well getting this, started up? 
the sign on the send to Houston for confirmation looks like the last step after mm -hmm. the final cement plug is set, which did never happened. Uh, because why did it not happen? I don't. I don't know. That's what we all need to know. Oh, see. So uh, I'd like you to get for or the record the information as to whether Houston was notified, whether Houston uh, approved the procedure, whether they signed off on the decision to displace mud with seawater after the negative pressure test dis discrepancy, and whether MMS signed off on this procedure. I am I correct in, in assuming your technical expert believed that MMS had to sign off on this as well? Do you know? The, the temporary abandonment sundry notice would have a, 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 a broad procedure that the MMS would have signed off on. I, I the broad procedure? Well, it, okay. I can't say if this matches that or it's exactly okay. Well, same. if you can get us more information for the record, I'd okay. appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Barton, for questions, please. Well, uh, thank you, Chairman. And uh, I thank our witnesses for continuing to, uh, to be here. I want to take a little bit different tack this round of questions. Um, I think what Chairman Waxman just asked was very appropriate. I think those are good questions, and I think they deserve um, thoughtful responses. Um, but I want to take a little bit broader view. My first question, does each of you at the panel support uh, drilling in our coastal waters? Is there anybody who thinks we ought to suspend drilling in the Outer Continental Shelf because of this accident? I see. <laughs> Say yes or no. or. Nod your head, give some. Congressman, I, I think a, a, a pause, similar to what Secretary, Secretary Salazar has asked for, I think a pause is prudent uh, to, to reassess um, ongoing operations in the, in the Gulf of Mexico. But I believe that uh, energy is so important to our economy, and the Gulf of Mexico is uh, a domestic source of that energy, that I believe that, uh, that continued drilling in the Outer Continental Shelf is fundamental to the U.S. economy. Do you all support drilling in the ultra-deep Gulf? I, I have confidence we're going to figure out what happened here and that if there are uh, improvements and there probably will be some that need to be made, will be made, and I have confidence that the deep water and the ultra-deep water can be developed and it's important to be developed. If this accident had occurred onshore under exactly the same scenario, you had a well that was a 20,000-foot well that had the capability to produce somewhere between 50,000 and 100,000 barrels per day, and in, in the switching it over, getting it ready for production, you had, you had an, an unexplained event that caused a blowout. Would that event onshore be fixed by now? If everything was the same except it wasn't in 5,000 feet of water, it was onshore Texas or Louisiana, would you have the well under control by now? I th let me try that. I, th I think intervention is easier onshore, obviously, because you can get people and equipment around it uh, easier than 5,000 feet of water. But there, there have been blowouts onshore that require relief wells to be drilled. And uh, so I don't think you can automatically say onshore it would be easy and offshore it's not. I mean, relief wells are things that have to be used sometimes onshore. But the likelihood is that the complicating factor in trying to cap it, stop it, staunch it is that you're 5,000 feet down and you're operating everything with remote controlled submarines. Is that not correct? As, as um, Commandant Allen has said, you, you have no ability to have human inter intervention in, at 5,000 feet. Has any federal official in, in a position of authority offered any suggestion that has not been accepted? In other words, we've had lots of members say that you guys are just dopes, that you haven't figured out what to do about it yet, that any good um, college petroleum engineering class ought to be able to figure out what to do and get it done. Has, has anybody in the Coast Guard, the Department of the Interior, the Mineral Management Service, Office of the President, the Office of the Vice President, uh, has anybody offered a suggestion that y'all have rejected on what to do to solve this problem? 
I'm not aware of any suggestions that, that we haven't been able to take in or, or to, to materially change what we're doing. I, uh, this response is, is of massive dimension with technical experts from all over the world working, including the government, and there have been no incremental solutions that I know or other parallel paths that I know of to pursue. Well, I've only visited the site one time and we went to the command center for about a one hour briefing, but my, my analysis is that there is excellent cooperation between the federal government and the private sector and that the Coast Guard, who's the, uh, the, the admiral, uh, who's the on-site commander, uh, is, is making sure that everybody does the best possible to work together and that this is not a case where the federal government and the private sector are in an adversarial situation and uh, it seems to me that there is excellent cooperation. Do you all agree with that? Everybody? I do. Okay. Um, I want to put this in perspective, Mr. Chairman, before, before I have to yield back my time. This, this um, accident as far as we know, is releasing 5,000 barrels a day into the Gulf of Mexico. It's been doing so for approximately three weeks. That's a little over 100,000 barrels. The largest spill in the Gulf of Mexico to date was a spill off the coast of Mexico. It produced 90,000 barrels a day for nine months. 90,000 barrels a day for nine months. Uh, Exxon Valdez was a tanker that ran aground in Alaska that was a super tanker that was three to 400,000 barrels of oil. So far, this spill has produced a little over 100,000 barrels. Now, that in and of itself is a significant spill, and is, it is a non-trivial accident, but it is nowhere near yet the order of magnitude of other, other accidents that have happened around the world. There is a natural seepage in the oceans around the United States on an annual basis of four million barrels a year. There is an annual seepage worldwide of over 40 million barrels of oil per year. So this, while it is an accident, it is non-trivial, it is not of the catastrophic consequences that some in the mainstream media have made it out to be. If we work together, and this subcommittee is doing an excellent job of getting the facts on the table for the American people, there is no reason that in the next, hopefully the next week or so, but certainly in the next two months, We'll, be, we'll stop the oil from flowing, we'll come up with new best practices and if necessary new technology and new legislation to prevent this in the, prevent this in the future. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Barton. Mr. Braley, for questions, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And my math certainly is not as good as the ranking members because he is, after all, an engineer. But the briefing we received, we were informed that these relief wells could take 90 days to complete. And if that is the case and we are not able to cap off the flow of oil and it gets worse, then we will easily in the next 90-day period exceed the quantity of oil that was spilled by the Exxon Valdez. It is not a trivial problem to the people living and who get their livelihood from the Gulf Coast. And Mr. McKay, we have been reassured by the federal government and you stated today that BP will pay all necessary cleanup costs and is committed to paying all legitimate economic damages associated with this spill. Is BP self-insured for all of these items of loss and damage? Yes. So your corporation will be on the hook. It has not insured any of that risk or reinsured any of that risk. Is that correct? That's correct. <clears throat> uh, one of the things I'm concerned about is reports that have come out recently, Mr. Newman, uh, specifically National Public Radio broadcast, uh, dealing with efforts by your company to compel Deepwater Horizon crew members to sign forms the day after the accident, stating they suffered no injuries from the incident or the evacuation. And yesterday, the committee staff was allowed to review several of those signed forms, and I want to read for you the key passage for the record. The form states, quote, I was not a witness to the incident requiring the evacuation and have no first-hand or personal knowledge regarding the incident. I was not injured as a result of the incident or the evacuation. Is it your understanding that was the language in the forms that were presented to your employees? That is the language on those forms, Congressman. Are you aware of any information given to those employees before they were asked to sign those forms? 
between the time the individuals arrived on shore and the time they were presented with those forms, there was a tremendous amount of information provided to our employees in the form of support, medical care, uh, clothing, food, hotel rooms, uh, discussion with them about uh, how we were going to facilitate their travel. Okay, let me cut you off because my question goes to the language in this document. Was there a briefing given to them about what was the intent of the form and why they were being asked to sign it? Uh, because I wasn't there, Congressman, I can't tell you exactly. Who, who gave them these forms to sign? They would have been presented by the support team that Transocean mobilized to Louisiana to facilitate the onshore assistance of those individuals as they came in from the rig. How do we get the names of the individuals that were on that support team? We, we can provide that to you. Okay. It says in the form, I was not a witness to the incident. What was the incident that was referred to in these forms? The, the incident would have been the, uh, the well control problem on the rig floor and the subsequent explosions. All right. Given that description of the incident, there were no witnesses to the incident, were there? There are no remaining Transocean individuals alive who were on the rig floor at the time of the event. I don't believe so. Right. And when it says no firsthand or personal knowledge regarding the incident, did anybody explain to these employees what that meant? Uh, again, Congressman, because I wasn't there, I'm not sure exactly what was explained to the individuals. Well, the press reports indicate that the crew members who survived the explosion spent somewhere between 12 to 15 hours on a nearby vessel as they watched the rig burn. And after the survivors made it to shore, your company escorted them to a hotel for questioning. These men, many of whom were exhausted, potentially traumatized, and desperate to contact their loved ones, had to decide whether or not to sign that form before going home. Do you know, Mr. Newman, whether these employees were allowed to consult with their personal physicians, counselors, or attorneys before they signed those forms? Congressman, the, the Transocean employees were not forced to sign the That's form. That's not my question. My question was, were they allowed to consult with a physician, a counselor, or their attorneys before they signed the statement? Because some individuals uh, didn't sign the, the statement until a week or so after the event, uh, they could have had consultation with anybody they chose to have consultation with. How many individuals waited a week or so after the event to sign the form? I don't know that, but we can provide that to you. Please do. They also interviewed on NPR one of, your, um, one of the Deepwater crew members, a Christopher Choi, who did sign the Transocean form. He says that he was angry because he wasn't able to talk to his physician or attorney. And let me tell you what his experience was. He saw multiple explosions and flames coming out of the derrick. He saw men pile into one lifeboat while two others burned. He saw his friends and co-workers with burning flesh and broken bones. He lived through this disaster and saw those things that I hope you and I never have to experience in our life. Can you tell us why he was asked to sign a statement that he had no firsthand or personal knowledge regarding the incident after experiencing that? Uh, one of our concerns in the aftermath of this event, Congressman, is to conduct as thorough a fact-finding exercise as we can. And part of the facilitation of that fact-finding exercise is to identify individuals who might have helpful knowledge. And wouldn't you agree with me that a reasonable interpretation of the words first-hand or personal knowledge regarding the incident might mean people who had witnessed the aftermath of that explosion and the impact that it had on employees who were working on that rig? Uh, I'm not sure I, I can. Uh, I'm, do you want to engage in a debate about the terminology? I'm not trying to engage in a debate. Knowledge. I'm just asking you if that wouldn't be a reasonable understanding that someone who had witnessed the things that Mr. Choi described would have firsthand or personal knowledge regarding the incident. That might be true. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gett, for questions, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Newman, many of the independent experts who looked at the initial reports from the oil spill came to the same conclusion, which was that the failure of the cementing process was likely a cause of the blowout. 
And you said in your statement that we know, quote, with certainty that on April 20th there was a, quote, sudden catastrophic failure of the cement, the casing, or both. How, in your opinion, do we know that the cementing or casing or both failed? Uh, Congresswoman, the reservoir that, that we believe is uh, flowing hydrocarbons is located 13,000 feet below the seabed. Uh, the, the pathway from the reservoir to the seabed should have been barriered off by cement and or casing. In other words, in order for the hydrocarbon to get from 13,000 right. feet below the seabed to the seabed, you have to have a failure of one or both of those barrier mechanisms. Right. And, and since, since, okay, okay. Um, let me ask you this. Who is responsible for determining the specifications for the cementing? Um, do you know? Mr. McKay. Um, I'm speculating, but we would write a, uh, a, a spec for the, what type of casing and the whole conditions, and we would look to um, Halliburton, in this case, to Your help with the cement design. So, so you would do the specifications, and then they would modify them as needed. Is that correct? We would, we would tell them what we want cemented, the type of casing, the whole conditions we think. Then, sorry. Okay. And, um, um, Mr. Probert, uh, I wanted to ask you, Halliburton is the largest cementing provider for the oil and gas industry, including both offshore and onshore drilling. Are the techniques that Halliburton uses to cement offshore wells similar to those it uses for onshore oil and gas cementing? Uh, it's really, a f <coughs> in many respects, a function of the individual well. Well, the basic principles are the same. Um, obviously, a, a deep uh, and challenging well like this will be uh, cemented quite differently than a well that will be onshore. So, there, so there is some difference, not just onshore and offshore, but from well to well, correct? Yes. Each, each yeah. well has a unique program. Okay. Um, uh, Mr. Moore, I wanted to talk to you a few minutes about the emergency systems on the blowout preventer stack that Cameron International assembled. It seemed to me like several things might have gone wrong that could have been prevented. Chairman Stupak referred in his statement to the report that several crew members witnessed the emergency disconnect system being engaged. The EDS was supposed to close the shear ramps and, dis and disengage the riser from the well. But the EDS did not work because neither of these things happened. So, so my question is, um, Cameron doesn't dispute that someone on the deep water horizon pressed the button for the emergency system, does it? No, we don't. And my understanding is that your technical experts think that something else went wrong. One possibility is that communications between the blowout preventer and the deep water horizon were destroyed before the system fully engaged. Can you explain briefly how this would have prevented the emergency system from functioning? Well, the uh, control pods that function the uh, blowout preventers is, uh, is electrically uh, actuated, so, and then, and then that sends a signal down to the control pods, which a then... Ti a time signal, right? Well, it's yeah. instantaneous, and okay. so if you, lose that, uh, if you lose that electrical connection to the pod, then that signal would not make it. Yeah, my, my understanding is that the um, EDS button wouldn't be hit unless the situation was dire, and that would require the communication lines to be intact for another full minute to function. Um, that doesn't seem to anticipate the type of emergency that happened on the deep rider horizon. So I want to ask you about another part of the system that might have failed, and that is um, the emergency disconnect system had a dead man switch, that it would automatically close the shear ramps and seal the well if something goes wrong, even if the emergency button is not pressed. We were told by Cameron during interviews that in order for the dead man switch to activate, three things had to happen. The communications had to fail, the hydraulics had to fail, and the electrical power had to fail. Is that correct, Mr. Moore? That is correct. Okay. The dead man system is, uh, is, is really designed to function when the riser parts from the wellhead. Right. 
Now, your engineering expert told us that it's possible the dead man switch did not activate immediately after the explosion because the hydraulic line could have remained intact. Is that correct? That could be a possibility. Now, Mr. Moore, here's the important question then. Shouldn't the dead man switch be designated to automatically seal a well once a catastrophic event happens, like the kind of incident that occurred on Deepwater Horizon? Well, I. I I just repeat that it was designed to function when the riser parts. Uh, if the riser is still attached and there is a control line still attached, then it could allow that function to not. In right, but in, in this situation, everything failed, and yet the dead man, man switch didn't activate immediately. Well, the riser was still connected to the, uh, to the horizon uh, rig for a couple of days, I believe. So, so you don't you don't think it should be automatic designed to automatically seal the well if if there's a catastrophic situation like this? I think that's something we have to look at. Yeah, I think so too. Thank you very much, you. Uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I just want to say one last thing, which is, you know, I didn't want to get into a big argument with Mr. Probert about about the liability, but I, I I was a little I felt that the witnesses were a little more forthcoming today about willingness to clean up the situation. But I was I was dismayed in his testimony when he talked about uh, when he talked about deflecting blame from Halliburton by saying that they were simply following BP's well construction plan. Because it seems to me that with all of these systems, it's obvious there was a catastrophic failure and it might have been systemic on every level. And so I'm hoping every player here works colla collaborative with, with, with each other, not just to clean up and pay for these damages, but to identify how it happened, whether it was a, whether it was a, you know, a perfect storm or whatever it was, because otherwise we can't have that, that faith as we move forward, as I said in my opening statement, we can't have that faith. In, in supporting offshore drilling until we know how we can prevent those failures because while they're rare, they're devastating. Thank you. Well, if I could just respond and say we are committed to working closely with all parties to ensure that we understand exactly what took place, whatever it may be, and uh, use it as a basis for improving the safety of operations going forward. Thank you. Ms. Sutton for questions, please. Uh, b before you begin, let me just... Uh, Mr. Scalise has asked that the uh, article he referred to from the Times Picnoon, uh, gas surge shut well a couple of weeks before Gulf oil spill, that'll be made part of the record without objection. And if you want to deliver it to the uh, witnesses, uh, he may follow it up with some questions. So I thought I'd give you guys a chance to at least take a look at it. Uh, Ms. Sutton, for questions, five minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, I just have to start with some clarification. Um, Mr. Newman, uh, following up on my colleague, Representative Braley's line of questions and about the, uh, the, the statements that people were asked to sign uh, shortly after the uh, incident, can we have that statement again on the, on the screen? Can somebody pull that up? My question to you is this. Are you telling us in this committee and the American people that this statement and asking people to sign this shortly after this unbelievable event had happened in their lives, that you were trying to find out the facts rather than trying to limit your liability and this is the statement that was used to try and find out the facts? With all due respect, Congresswoman, there is absolutely no limitation of liability in any of those statements. So my, my question to you is then that this statement was offered to these employees because it was an attempt to find out the facts. Is that your, is that your testimony? In the immediate aftermath of the event, Congresswoman, our first concern was on the health and well-being of our people. We mobilized a team to South Louisiana to meet our people as they it's came It's just ashore. really a yes or no question. It had nothing to do with limiting our liability. Okay, so again, the question was, are you telling us that this statement, you asked them to sign it because you were trying to investigate the facts? And this is the statement you used to further that. A statement identifying... It's just a yes or no question. A statement identifying individuals who might have helpful information... Okay, let's, let's move on. Since you're not going to answer the question, I'll take your failure to answer the question as the answer to the question. Um, can you tell me, um, do you operate rigs off of Norway or Brazil? We do operate rigs in Norway and Brazil. 
Okay. What kind of a blowout safety systems do your rigs in other parts of the world have? Um, can you share that with us? The rigs around the world have uh, blowout prevention equipment similar to what was employed on the Deepwater Horizon. Okay. The control systems in two regulatory regimes, Norway and Canada, the control systems require an acoustic backup system as well. Okay, so I understand. So how much would a, uh, a duplicate blowout preventer cost? Can you tell me that? A duplicate blowout preventer? The yeah. entire system? Yeah. How much would that cost? Uh, I haven't quoted one recently. My guess is they would be in the realm of $15 million. Okay. Um, let, let me move on to uh, Halliburton and uh, Mr. Probert. In an incident last year, there was a well blown out uh, near Australia. I mentioned it earlier in my questions to Mr. McKay, the Montero spill. What caused that blowout? Well, there's a commission, excuse me. Uh, there, there's a commission of an inquiry which is underway for the Montero blowout in Australia in the Timor Sea. And the, uh, the commission hasn't produced its findings. In fact, I think just finished gathering evidence about three or four days ago. Okay, so we but, don't know yet? So we don't know yet. Was but, Halliburton involved in the well cementing? We were involved in the well cementing, but what we do know from the public testimony is that uh, a five-month period elapsed between the time that cementing was completed and that the uh, well control uh, issue took place. We also know from the testimony that the um, well owner in this particular case did not put a surface um, plug in place to protect the well when the blowout preventer was removed, nor did they put a corrosion cap on top of the well. So. Uh, well was left open to the elements for about five months. So uh, I think the inquiry is what we will need to look to okay. to find out. So, exactly so is it possible that there's a relationship to the causes of each of these blowouts in your opinion? Uh, I, it's impossible to say until okay. we get uh, details from the inquiry, but it seems unlikely that there's a, a link. Does the testing of cement change with the increasing depth of the wells? I'm sorry, with the increasing... Does the testing of cement change mm -hmm. with the increasing depth of wells? Well, um, there are more casing strings which are run, as you have seen from the schematic on this well, there were actually nine that, that were run, casing and liner strings. And so each one of those is tested. Uh, the, uh, the first eight uh, are tested in a slightly different fashion because we drill out afterwards because we're going to go... Okay, down. I'm just asking about in relation to the depth of the wells. Uh, I would the say as a result of the number of pieces of casing, yes, that okay. will test. Okay. Um, and just, just let me um, clarify one other thing. Um, our, our, our distinguished colleague, um, uh, the ranking member of the full committee, had mentioned that uh, he, he thought that perhaps you had been presented as uh, some dolts because you don't know what to do in the aftermath of this incident, but I would just say uh, to the contrary, you were certainly capable of figuring out how to develop and drill and, and profit from it, but what we're concerned about, what I'm concerned about is, um, is that you didn't figure out for whatever reason, um, and I haven't heard a good reason yet, about how to do it safely so as to prevent this kind of disaster. And the final question I have is at the beginning of the Bush administration, there were closed meetings, and I'm glad Mr. Burgess reminded me of this, uh, held by Vice President Cheney to discuss issues related to energy policy. And I know that BP participated in those uh, from previous testimony. Um, were any of the other companies, did they have representatives in those meetings? And, uh, and can you just share with me whether or not you know if uh, there was any discussion of, of trying to uh, uh, find ways to responsibly prevent this kind of disaster? I, I don't know whether or not Transocean was a participant in that. I think it would be very easy for us to confirm that for the committee. I'm not aware that Cameron was either, but we can confirm it. I have no knowledge either, but again, we'll look into it and let you know. Thank you. Mr. Scalise, five minutes for questions, please. Okay, thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I gave you all a copy of the, uh, the article that's titled Gas Surge Well Shut, uh, Shut Gas Surge Shut Well a couple of weeks before Gulf Oil Spill. That was from yesterday. And, uh, and if you could take a look at that, because I still want to get those answers uh, about it, not only the time that's mentioned in that article, but how many times total uh, that well was shut down. Um, 
I also want to uh, refer yesterday there was a, a hearing in New Orleans uh, in an in investigation that's underway as well as some of the ones that are happening here. Uh, but there was testimony there in one of the, uh, I guess one of the supply ships, the Bankston, I guess supplied uh, the Horizon. Uh, there was testimony by the first mate of the Bankston who said that weeks before the accident they had to clear mud off the rig because of what they heard was a quote loss of circulation. Are you familiar about uh, with that, uh, that incident where there was mud that had to be cleared off of the rig, uh, Mr. McKay or Mr. Newman? I'm, I'm not aware of that. I mean, this was, a, this was a public hearing yesterday, an investigation into this. I would imagine somebody at BP yeah. was monitoring this. I'm sure they were. They, I'm sure they were. I'm just but saying. You, I'm does your aware. technical expert have any information on that? No. No. Well, get me whatever you have on that, Mr. Newman. Do you know? I'm not familiar with the details of that event. No. Uh, and I'll be happy to provide that article as well. But, but this was a hearing and an investigation into this incident that happened yesterday. I would hope somebody at Transocean and BP know about this and can answer questions about this because this goes to the heart of uh, was there or uh, were there a series of problems prior to the explosion uh, that weren't being dealt with and, and of course if you can't answer it somebody at BP somebody at Transocean is going to know about this uh, get me all of that information but also I want to know what safety changes were made after this one or multiple shutdowns occurred because if a shutdown occurs, that's not, that's not something that's supposed to happen, especially if, if mud's coming out because you're, you're not controlling the flow of the natural gas. It's, 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 it's a well that's been described here. This was a very difficult well, not a typical well. And these are people who were working on this well saying this. Y'all should know about this because there are other wells that are out there, but if there's a well that's a tip, not a typical well that's causing problems, I would imagine you would take other safety precautions to address that. Maybe you didn't. But you need to get me that information as well as the number of times it was shut down, what safety changes were made after uh, those problems were recognized. Uh, so moving on, it it's, seems like, and, and this is something else that's discussed in the uh, first article I gave you, uh, it seems like there was a disagreement, a serious, it's described here as a heated disagreement between BP, Transocean, and Halliburton regarding the process of uh, removing the mud and putting in the uh, the seawater and this was this was described as being prior to uh, the uh, prior to the cement being completed now first of all I'll let each each of the three parties that are mentioned here uh, Mr. Newman do you know about a disagreement between the parties on what is the best way to install or to, to remove the mud and when to remove the mud and how much to remove uh, were y'all in agreement or do you know Congressman I'm not aware of any disagreement. The first reference to any confusion with respect to what was happening on the rig uh, I learned of during Chairman Waxman's opening comments today. Okay, Mr. McKay? Uh, same thing. I, that's the first I'd heard of that. Mr. Probert? I mean, Halliburton would not normally be involved in that process, so I can't imagine there would be any, um, any disagreement. Well, again, I mean, there are people who were on that rig saying that this heated disagreement occurred. Is it a standard protocol then uh, for the process that was used to remove the mud and replace it with seawater? Is, is this a permitted process? Did you have to file a plan for just how that process was going to go? Because uh, clearly there were some problems and it could be one of the main problems in relation to the explosion. Uh, is this a standard process for when to remove uh, the, the, the mud or is it something that you all kind of decide as you're there on the spot? I'll go again, Mr. Newman. D displacing the riser with seawater to recover the drilling mud is a normal part of the well abandonment process. So it's not something that should be disagreed upon by the parties involved? The removal, the, the displacement of the riser to seawater is, should, should not be a subject of disagreement. That, okay, that Mr. process McKay, is that part of the normal process of abandoning the well. I believe the procedure is part of the temporary abandonment sundry notice that's filed with the MMS. Um, and it's, uh, so there should have been a standard protocol filed with MMS I, I on believe, this I, displacement procedure? I believe that the, the procedure would be filed with the temporary abandonment sundry notice, yes. Okay, and if you can give me a copy of that as well, and then Mr. Probert, if, if you know of any disagreement there, or just is that a standard process? Um, 
uh, I believe it's uh, part of a, a standard process. Okay. And, he and was that the process, Mr. McKay? Was that the point where you were when the explosion occurred? Do you know exactly where in the process, what operation was being performed on the rig at the time of the explosion? The I don't know the exact time. I mean, this is what the investigation is working on. We have an investigation that started gathering the information that you're, some of it, you know, is witness accounts that we haven't been able to talk to yet. And finally, I know this is out of time now, but um, final question. Uh, in terms of the, the process of paying the fishermen and, and all others whose livelihoods are directly impacted by their inability to go and, and earn a living right now because of this, what is the process for, for getting them reimbursed? Uh, clearly, there are a lot of people that are very nervous. Uh, you know, one more week, two more weeks might be the difference between them going bankrupt or having their house foreclosed. Uh, what is that process, and, and what kind of assurance can you give that those, those people directly impacted will be able to be made whole in a quick, reasonable amount of time? We, we, we have a, a, a process underway to um, meet people's needs on the coast immediately. Uh, we've got claims numbers to call. We've actually got community centers to visit as well. We've paid out, I think, over a thousand claims already. And most of it is to fishermen who aren't working and, and need it for their cash flow. And that's, that's where our emphasis has been so far. Okay. And if you could provide that process okay. to the committee as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Excalese. Um, I think Mr. Burgess and I have a few more questions and we'll wrap up this hearing. So let's go one more round, uh, five minutes each. Uh, Mr. Newman, I'd like to ask you about the risk and hazard analysis that your company performed regarding the blowout preventer. Four days in August of 2003, Transocean personnel examined every possible hazard on the deep water horizon rig to figure out what could possibly lead to a major accident. Transocean evaluated the safety of the BOP and found that even though BOPs had failed in the past, the likelihood of a VOP, BOP failure was low because it was not a frequent occurrence. Transocean then rated the severity of a BOP failure as extremely severe, which means the risk could result in multiple fatalities or a massive oil spill. So Mr. Newman, your staff knew several years ago that the BOP component failure would inflict major damage on your crew, your company, and the environment. So, my question is, why wouldn't you do more to protect against a BOP failure? Um, if, I, if I put your company's risk analysis on the screen, and um, tab seven in the book there, if you want to look at it, uh, it's the last page of, of tab seven of that document. The environmental catastrophe taking place now is one of those predicted as possible by your experts. First, it says possible blowout with possible multiple fatalities and possible loss of rig. Second, possible environmental impact. The preventive measures listed here included testing, inspections, and maintenance. Yet today, as I mentioned in my opening, and it's been mentioned a couple times today, we learned that the BOP with, had a hydraulic, a leaky hydraulic system, dead battery, and a configuration or design that actually interfered with the BOP safety features. So, Mr. Newman, if, if you knew the risk, did the company take the necessary safeguards uh, for the BOP? I mean, isn't there something more you could have done to make sure, knowing the extreme severity of an accident, that they could make sure this BOP was working properly? Chairman, over the last several years, we have continued to improve our maintenance practices with respect to blowout preventers, and we have continued to apply rigorous and uh, strict testing protocols on a regular basis that would identify any failure. Well, what about, you know, because we have the, we've heard a lot about the dead men's switch, just the batteries. Is, is, do you have any tests developed that you can test the batteries to make sure that they're going to work? So if everything else fails, the batteries will still work and we can close those rams and shear this the baby off? We, we test the batteries when the BOP is on the surface. On the surface, but not when it's in the water. When, when was this BOP put in the water? I believe it was put in the water in the first week of February. Okay, so that'd be about two or three months. I, I, I guess my, my question is this. Um, when you get done with this BOP, let's say we didn't have this problem, if, do you use BOPs over and over? Uh, yes. Okay. This is 2001. Uh, this BOP was manufactured. Have they improved since uh, 2010? In the last nine years, have we had improvements in the BOPs to make them more safeguard so we don't have these failures of leaky valves and dead batteries and, and to make sure they work? Do we have new improved BOPs? The technology that was developed in the late 1990s 
when the industry first built rigs capable of operating in 10,000 feet of water. Sure. Is largely the same as what's employed today. Okay. Do you have new improved ones, Mr. Moore? Congressman, is, is over a 10-year period, yes, things do evolve. But uh, we build our stacks the last 20 to 30 years that properly maintained and used in the environment that, in which they're designed for. Okay. Well, let me ask you this, because it came up earlier, the acoustic uh, BOP would be a redundancy system. Knowing what we know about this accident, if we had an acoustic BOP as a redundant system, would that have worked? Would that have shut off, pinched off this pipe so we wouldn't have this oil coming out? Uh, the answer to that question, Chairman, depends on what's inside the BOP. Uh, if, if, if the BOP is somehow being prevented from functioning correctly, then another means of activating the BOP would not have offered any implement. Im Im would an acoustic BOP be stacked, or would it be off to the, somehow off the side to crimp this pipe? How, how, how would that work? What, what we're talking about, Chairman, is a, an acoustic control system. Okay. It is uh, another means of activating the BOP. It's not another BOP. Okay. It's simply another means of activating the but, BOP. But here, in order to activate this BOP, I think testimony has been that they probably hit the button on a rig when they realize there was a problem going on, right? They hit the button to activate the BOP. And you had to sever the communication, the power, and the hydraulic lines. Two out of three we know didn't work. The communications and power were cut. The hydraulic lines are still intact. Therefore, the dead men switch didn't work, correct? We're not sure the hydraulic line was severed. Okay. But, uh, if it wasn't, it would not know to, okay. to But even if it wasn't, if we had an acoustics on there, would that have shut if, down this BOP? It would be a method to shut it down. If there wasn't anything inside that BOP, it couldn't, it wasn't. Um, and we'll never know that until we get the BOP off. We'll not know really. that until we see it. All right. Uh, Mr. McKay, we asked for your uh, risk registry, and I know you said you'd get it. We still haven't received it. Would you see that we get your uh, risk registry for golf operations? Would you please provide that to us? Yes. Okay, more of my time. Mr. Burgess, five minutes for questions, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> Los Caps was asking some questions about the, uh, the work that's gone on in the last 30 years as far as the mitigation of a spill when it happens. Now, the, uh, there's a dispersant that's being, or was being injected, placed on the water and also being injected at the site of the spill. That dispersant, is that new or is that something that's been around for a while? And anyone, feel free to answer that. This technology is new. I mean, this is, this is uh, the first time it's been used a at any scale. And, and, and who, who's responsible or who was, has been responsible for the development of that product? Well, Nalco, uh, I believe it's Nalco as the manufacturer, Nalco Chemical. Now, I guess I'm a little confused. Did the EPA, you all approached the EPA for permission to use the dispersant below the surface. How long did it take to get the approval to use that? Well, we've, we've, we've requested several attempts, and there have been three tests. The last one ended um, yesterday, I think, at 4 something in the morning. Uh, that was a 24-hour test. It looks like the impact was really good. Um, we've asked uh, for the EPA to allow us to continue. Uh, I don't know as of yet if we've gotten the approval yet, but we're ready to go on continuous injection. Typically, how long does it take to get EPA approval to use a new material like that? I don't know. I don't know. Now, there, uh, I know the college in my district, uh, back in Denton, Texas, University of North Texas, does a lot of research on nanomaterials, and they've got what they call noble, medical, uh, noble metal nanoparticles, as well as porous metal organic frameworks that can absorb petroleum selectively and to, to a large differential. Uh, are you guys looking at using anything along those lines? Absolutely. I, I, think, I think it was a, a bit misleading earlier on technology. This industry has massively, massively scaled up for oil spill response in the Gulf Coast using all technologies. Right. And it doesn't have to be hay bales shot over the Gulf. There are large-scale, the ability to lar do large-scale dispersion. It's a massive so, amount of equipment in the Gulf Coast. Uh, okay. Let me, uh, you know, just going back to the temp pressure differential for a moment, Mr. McKay, Mr. Newman, either either one of you, when you get 
you know, the, a lot of what's happened today or a lot of the questions that have come up today kind of relate to who's in charge. And I, I guess, Mr. Newman, really it's, it's Transocean, the, the uh, offshore operations manager, whatever it's called, that is the person who's ultimately in charge of, of everything on the rig. It's, that's the captain of the ship, right? Well, if, if I could clarify that, Congressman, the, the, uh, an offshore drilling rig is a complex piece of equipment. There's a hotel out there to provide accommodation for the workers when they're not working. Uh, there's a power plant on the rig. There but are somebody's ultimately in charge of, of, of decisions, is there not? The, the offshore installation manager is ultimately responsible for the maintenance of the rig, for the material handling operations on the rig, for the condition of the hotel on the rig. Uh, the offshore installation manager cedes decision making to the customer representative when it comes to, when it okay. comes to decisions that respect the wellbore. So when you got an anomalous result on that pressure differential, is it ever appropriate, and really Mr. Newman or Mr. McKay, either one of you can answer this, is it ever appropriate to seek the advice or the permission, or what is the role of the uh, Mineral Management Service when something like that occurs? I don't know in a specific situation like that. But we're going to override an anomalous result and remove the drilling mud, which is the primary protector even before the blow-up protector is the primary protector of the well blowing out. Would, would, would you have ever consulted with, uh, with any uh, regulator at the federal level, or is that just not done? I, I, can't, I can't speculate on when a federal regulator would be contacted, whether that situation would apply or not. I don't know. The investigation is going to determine a lot of this. But. I guess that's really a question that's going to have to be answered. And, and Mr. Chairman, you know, it just brings us right back to where I started this morning. Well, I, we're going to have multiple hearings on this, I suspect. And at some point, we have got to involve Department of Interior, Department of Homeland Security, Mineral, Manage, uh, Mineral Management Services. We've got to involve these individuals. Now the name Carol Browner came up, the White House's energies are. It would be very interesting to have her come talk to us as well. We need to get the information, and it is unfortunately going to involve uh, getting the administration to be cooperative uh, with this committee for a change. So just with that caveat in mind, um, I'll yield back the balance of my time and thank you for, and our witnesses for a very productive hearing today. Well, thank you, Mr. Burgess. As you know, I don't believe in doing one hearing. I will get into an issue, and we will have further hearings here, and the administration may be appropriate at, at another hearing to have them here, including the Mineral Management Service and the administration on this issue and, and all the issues that have been before this uh, subcommittee and this Congress has been cooperative. Uh, even some document requests you have sent in the past have been, was, was worked out between us, so we will continue to work on it. Mr. Scalise, uh, any questions? Um, just first, on all of the, uh, the information that I'd asked from the panel, if they could get that to the full committee as well. And, uh, Correct. And I would just, it may, it may be good just to follow them up with written questions, too. Uh, as I'll say in a few minutes here, we have 10 days for further follow-up questions. Be happy to. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Mr. Chairman, can I ask that all materials on both sides that were uh, asked to be made available to the committee, made available to the committee staff as well? Yes. No objection. All, all information has been available. It's all been shared equally thus far. If there's anything further or something you don't think was there, please let us know. We'll make sure it's there. Let me ask one more question, Mr. Moore, if I may. The lessons we learned thus far about what worked and what didn't work with the BOP, the blowout preventer, do you, the Cameron company, do you think the design changes should be made to BOPs and should there be modifications to the existing BOPs in service now? I'm not sure. Congressman, I think we need to see what happened to that BOP. I think it would be um, to change something that's not broke. Um, we don't know what happened. Um, we do know that we're going to have to look at a lot of different things differently going forward in terms of how we move forward in this industry. Well, look at that design one. Just you know, you had your communications, your hydraulics, and and, and the um, um, the power. The power. It right. seems all three have to be severed before to work. I think one or two before to work. But well, the design, as I said, of that was to function when you lose the riser from sure. the BOP. And, and we didn't lose the riser here. We didn't lose the riser here. So um, we learned something. Okay. And Cameron's committed to make the changes to working with our customers and working with the industry to to uh, 
to move forward. Well, thank you. And thank you to all the witnesses. I know it's been a long day. Um, this is not an easy subject, and it's just beginning, and we're in the early stages. So there will be more questions and answers, I'm sure. And to, unfortunately, to the people who lost their lives, uh, our hearts go out to them and their families and co-workers. So thank you for being here. That concludes all questioning. I want to thank all of our witnesses for coming today and for your testimony. The committee rules provide that members have 10 days to submit additional questions for the record. I ask unanimous consent that the contents of our document binder be entered in record, provided that the committee staff may redact any information that is business proprietary, relates to privacy concerns, or is law enforcement sensitive. Without objection, documents will be entered in record. That concludes our hearing. The meeting of the subcommittee is adjourned.